So yesterday, we were talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is Jehovah. So we went into the scriptures, we compared Isaiah chapter 45, verse 21 to 23, and Philippians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, where the Bible was saying, you bow down before me. And Philippians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11, said God exalted his name above every other name, that you will bow and every tongue shall swear. So we can see there are parallels. So to debate that the Lord Jesus Christ is not God is evidence. All of us who are going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Christ will be the judge according to John chapter 5, verse 22 to 23. So we can see here that Jesus Christ is one true God. That should not be debated. We have seen other faith, they are trying to lessen the deity, the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. He came and paid the ultimate sacrifice. It is when we know him that we'll be able to worship him in spirit and in truth. Until we start treating him like a next door neighbor, or people, you hear people, there was a question which was asked yesterday, very um, a telling person, it was a very good question by all standards. Why do people claim that Jesus Christ is my friend? I have never heard the Lord saying, this is my friend. So you call you son, you call him my servant. Friend, I have not seen, I have not heard. But we can never be too familiar with the Lord. Even John, the, the beloved who wrote the book of Revelation, when we saw him, he fell down dead. And yet, this is the man in Matthew chapter 26, who was lying on the bosom of the Lord, saying, who is going to betray you? This is the man that fell down. What about you? Why do we become too familiar? So Isaiah chapter 45, that 22 and 23, it says, every knee will bow to me, Jehovah. I just want to find to finish this part, then we go to the, I want to show you things about Jesus Christ that many of us never understood or we have not been told. That's why we are too casual in our approach um, to the Lord. Until we know him, we will never worship him in spirit and in truth. Here it says, um, Isaiah chapter 45, verse 22 to 23. Look unto me and be ye saved. All the ends of the earth, for I am God. There is none else. Verse 23. I have sworn by myself, the word is gone out of my mouth in righteousness and shall not return. That unto me every knee shall bow and every tongue shall swear. This is the one that the Philippians chapter 2, verse 9 and 10 and 11 or 9 and 10 talks about. This is God speaking. So we can see these are the parallels and the mention of the name Jesus Christ. So we can see it should not be debated. So I want us to know which God we have prayed to. So there are many examples of the New Te Old Testament um, texts which point to the Lord Jesus Christ like the one that we talked about yesterday, Isaiah chapter 48, verse 12, Isaiah chapter 46, verse 4, Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6, 5 and 6, where he was talking about his God. You can verify some of them. I'm just putting them as they are coming. And then Revelation chapter 22, verse 18, where he said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He put everything together and he said, behold, I'm coming soon. The book of Revelation is about the Lord Jesus Christ and nothing more. So we need to understand that. We can compare a lot of texts, but um, I was thinking to put some of this um, text in a, um, PDF, in, a, in a PDF format so that you'll be able to cross-reference the text. It's a lot easy. 
So brethren, Jesus Christ wears the unique names of the deity. It would be blasphemy if he did not have these names. He is included or he must be included in the one true God. So this is from yesterday. Today, we want to show that the Lord Jesus Christ possesses the characteristics of God. We want to see, you remember in the work, in, in the beginning was the word, the word was God, nothing which was created, nothing created was um, that he did not create. So we want to see the scriptures. Is it true that the Lord Jesus Christ is God? Where do we find it in the scriptures? Why do people call him angel? Why do people call him different names? Why do we not accept that he's God? God was manifested in flesh. Even the angels, you see, they were surprised when you read the book of Timothy, Second Timothy chapter three, they were surprised why? They were surprised because um, men did not know that God is walking amongst them because he came from heaven, the angels must have known him. I don't know what face he wore, whether the same face or the other face, we don't know. But the one thing that we know, he was there before. So certain characteristics are unique to God. No one but God. Surely no created being can possess those things, those qualities. So we're going to go into five or six characteristics that confirms that the Lord Jesus Christ is deity. No man can possess those things because it will constitute. The Bible says he possesses all the fullness of the body, which is the deity. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. He is the represent the very image of the Father when the Bible says. Let us, can somebody read for me Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, and Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. I want us to show. Because it's a Bible study, we need to go a little bit deeper so that we deepen our understanding. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9. I read. Colossians 2, 9, I read. Amen. Says, For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Amen. And then Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. I'm in the I'm very sorry about that, please. It's okay. Hebrews 1, 3. Yeah. Who be who be the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, where he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty. Sorry, he, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Amen. Amen. He is the very image of the Father. Is it true? Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 says, Who being in the let us um sister Sonia, can you read that for me? Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, please. Amen. Please, I'm no I'm okay. Dada, Dada Helen. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. Philippians 2, 5 and 6. If you are not there, I can read. Oh, I thought Sister Helen is reading. I read. Okay. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, I read. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus who being in the form of God, thought it's not robbery to be equal with God. Amen. 
who was in the form of God. This is the Bible. It's not my opinion. He, being in the form of God, he did not consider it robbery. It's a God, ah, God, we are equal now. Why do you want to do this? But he said, no, he humbled himself even to the death on the cross. So the Lord Jesus Christ wears the unique names of God. It follows that he is God. He has got the characteristics of God. So we're going to look at the characteristics of God now so that we explore them together and check whether the Bible confirms those things or not. So if the Lord Jesus Christ possessed these qualities, he must have possessed them. Is it true? Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 said, the Lord Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So that means it does not change. So deity cannot cease to be deity, and it cannot lose the characteristics of a deity. If I'm an African man, as I am, I cannot cease to be an African man that I am. Living in Europe shouldn't change anything about me. So the first quality of God is eternally existent. Eternal existence is a characteristic only of God. All the other people were created. Jehovah, the true God, has always existed and will always exist. That's why when you said, when you pray, you are not doing me a favor. Neither are you doing God a favor. We are not doing God a favor. Let us repeat that part so that we understand it. When you come to church, you are doing yourself a favor by fellowshipping because the, um, is it in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 25, the gathering of the saints, the fellowship of the saints. When we come together, we will strengthen one another. It's very important. So there was never a time where God did not exist. He was not created. He is the everlasting maker or creator of all temporary created things. The power of a eternal existence is only eternal existence, that's self-existence. It is only the characteristics of the living God. So the names of God demonstrate the nature. It demonstrates the nature. Jehovah, the I am, the one that we read yesterday is uh, Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, where Moses was saying, who should I say sent me? You said, hey, well, the Hebrew names that I, I gave us yesterday, they are not necessary. You don't need to know it in Hebrew. It doesn't make you a better Christian. What makes you a better Christian is to live what you learn in the Bible. Not come and say, Yahweh, Jehovah. These are Hebrew names. They are not English names. So the most important thing when you say the I am, that means it's the, he is pres past, present, and continuous. He is always there. He will always be there. So the names of God demonstrate this eternal nature. I am, first and last, all imply eternal self and self-existence. Like we said yesterday, where the Lord Jesus Christ was mentioned only for the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember in John 58, when we read John 58, when um, John, uh, John, is it 558, when the, um, the, um, the Pharisees wanted to beat him up, he said, before Abraham, I was. He said, you fellow, you are not even 50. And you are saying, Abraham. So these are the things that they refused because they knew in Hebrew, because the story of Moses has been told throughout the generations. Remember the Ten Commandments, those laws were meant for, those, for, for the Jews. That's why the Lord Jesus Christ, when you're speaking in John chapter 17, when you say, I have got other sheep which are not in this fold. But after you go to the cross, you will come. That's where the curtain was, was split so that we all can come in. So it's important for us to understand that. Psalms 90 verse 1 to 4. Jehovah is everlasting to everlasting. It does not change. Can somebody read for me Psalms chapter 90 verse 1 to 4? I read in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, thou hast been 
our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Verse 3. Thou turnest man to destruction and sayest, Return ye children of men. For, for a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. Amen. Amen. Can you read Psalms 93, verse 2, please? Okay. 90 verse 93 verse 2 93 verse 2 yeah. I read in Jesus name Amen. To, to show forth thy loving kindness in the morning and thy faithfulness every night Amen did you read, you read some 93 Okay, you say 92. 93 verse 2. 93 verse 2. There's okay. a read I want, I want from there. Okay, 93 verse 2 I read. Mm -hmm. Thy throne is established of old. Thou art from everlasting. Amen. Thy throne is established of, thy throne is of old, is established from it was there before. This is the Bible confirming. Let us hear what prophet Isaiah said. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. How hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. Hallelujah. There is no searching. I think, um, I don't know what the sister Noelle is in today, Is Sister Noella in today? Ah, she's not here. Okay. I wanted to answer a question. Say there is no, and there is no. Uh, the Bible said there is no searching of his understanding. So no person can come and claim to know God. You can never know God. It is impossible. We need to live several thousands of years to know a little bit of Him. So this is the Bible, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8. We can read, we can write down Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 40. They all confirms all these things, that he is from everlasting. Olam, this means from everlasting to everlasting. He was there. In the book of Habakkuk, 1 verse 2, it's the same thing. In you, God, said Isaiah, you said Isaiah 40, verse, verse 8, 8, 8, 8, 8, 8. 28. Okay, okay. Thank when, you. when we see us talking about from everlasting to everlasting from this, when we see a Bible verse, it must contain those things that we are reading about. Then we can read also from Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. God inhabits eternity. That's God for you. This is the Bible. Because we are trying to see we are trying to make brethren know or us to understand what, what does it mean. Isaiah chapter 57, verse 15. It speaks the same thing again. For thus said the high and the lofty one that inhabited in um, eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and the holy place with him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble, to revive the spirit, the heart of the contrite ones. So God is speaking. We can see God is always from the old. He abides from the old. We can write some of the scriptures down. Habakkuk verse one, chapter one, verse 12. Habakkuk chapter one, verse 12. He abides from of old. The same thing that we read in um, Isaiah or Psalms, 
Psalms 90, we can see it also in Psalms 55, verse 19. He abides from old. That's why I called it the ancient of days. He is the ancient of days. The other scriptures that you read, I'll post them for you so that you see we have, um, I've selected a few that I'm going to post here. Please write these scriptures down. It helps you to understand who he is. Okay. These are the scriptures that I want you to write. You can check them, verify them. The other ones that we read, Psalms chapter 90, verse 1 to 4. Genesis chapter one, chapter 21, verse 33. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 40. These are all Bible verses that are, sh that are sh that is showing he is eternally existent. He was there before. That's why he's, he is from of old. He is from everlasting. The Bible is confirming. If you and me agree that the Bible is the word of God, then we must believe what it says. So the Lord Jesus Christ possesses the characteristics of an eternal existence. Is it true? Yes. Jesus Christ is not a created being, but he was um, existed, he existed eternally. Like I always say, he is the perfect uncreated light of God. That means he's not created. So the names of God imply that, simply imply or imply eternal self-existence, which are used for the Lord Jesus Christ. First and the last, I am in Jehovah. The ones that we read, yesterday, um, we read yesterday, confirm. Is it true that the Chimi, can you read for me the book of Micah chapter five, verse two? We want to see the scriptures, you know, when we read the scriptures, that the, the whole idea of a Bible study, to check with the scriptures, to confirm, is it true? Because we want to know whether it's true. When people try to question you, say, we are not giving one Bible verse, we are giving Bible verses. That will receive, say, oh, okay, now I understand. It takes your argument. Book of Micah, chapter five, verse two. Brother Chimi. Forgive me, I was reading. I didn't have a muted. <laughs> mm, I read Micah chapter 5, verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Hallelujah. And who is this king of kings? We can see it's pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no debate because he came from Bethlehem. From of old, that is the, it's called like a, that is the Hebrew name, but we don't need to know them. Let us read Matthew chapter two, verse four to six. I will just take this one quickly. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus is written by the prophet, and thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. So the Bible is confirming again, this is the prophecy being fulfilled in Micah chapter 5, verse 2. Auntie Jovita, can you read Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6? Sorry, I'm not disposed now. Ah, okay. Dada Jimmy. Isaiah chapter 9. Verse 6. Verse 6. Mm -hmm. Amen. 6, okay. 
For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Hallelujah. So the Bible is called, he's called, he's being called God by the Bible. Prince of peace. If mighty God. So when you hear these words, they've never been used on any other person except him that was to come. You can quickly read for me Psalms 102, verse 24 to 27. Twenty-four to one. Some one o. One o two, verse twenty, twenty-four to twenty-seven. Twenty-four, twenty-seven. I read. Twenty-four to twenty-seven. Yeah. Yes, I said, "Oh my God, take me not away in the midst of my days. Thy years are throughout all generations." Of old hast thou laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of thy hands. They shall perish, but thou shalt endure. Yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment. As a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end. Amen. Amen. So his years are throughout all the generations. The heaven and the earth are temporary. They are going to perish. Yes, you remember what the Lord Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 5. He said, heaven and the earth shall pass, but my words, no, not, not even a single letter will pass. So it's a confirmation that his years are, his years do not have um, an end. These years are throughout the generations. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 10 and 11. He says here, I, I, you are my witnesses, said the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall be there after me. After me, before there was none. Be and after me, there's not going to be any. Verse 11, I, even I, am the Lord. And beside me, there is no savior. I, even I, the Lord. This is the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. I, even the Lord, the savior. He is the savior. Which was confirmed by Jude, that he said the always knowing God. Due to one, due to the only one chapter, we can read the last verse, I think. Yeah, the last verse of Jude 25, Jude 1 25. It says, To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. That amen we said is the name of Jesus Christ. To the only wise God, our Savior, He is being addressed as God. This is Jude. This is, these are the half brothers of our earthly Lord Jesus Christ when he moved the earth. But he addressed them. He did not, they were not familiar. They feared. They only say, He's my brother. He's my this. They got the revelation that he is not, he just used, he just chose this family to be in this family. So we need to understand it. No God was formed before Jehovah. Not, neither shall I one be formed after him. So either the Lord Jesus Christ is a false God or the Bible is contradicting, or is a eternal like father. Is it true? Can you follow me to the book of John? John chapter one, verse three. Let us read and see what the Bible says. Is Jesus Christ God or the Bible is contradicting itself? Let us hear.
John three. No, John one three. John one three. Yeah. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So either he created himself, which sounds foolish, or else he's eternal. Hmm. Can you read for me Colossians chapter 1, verse 16? Let us, we want to look at the scriptures and see what does the Bible say. Let's see. Colossians 1, 16. Mm -hmm. For by him we are all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Amen. Amen. He created us for our pleasure. So the Bible is making it very clear. In Jesus were all things met, whether in heaven or on earth or under the sea. So Honestly, he did not make himself. That means he was not created. Whilst you are there, can you read for me Romans chapter 1, verse 25? We just want to see what the scripture says about him. Romans chapter 1, verse 25. 25. I read. Who changed? Romans chapter 1, verse 25. Yeah. Okay, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. Amen. Created things should not be worshiped. Is it true? Who is worshiping that which was created? But we saw that the Lord Jesus Christ was accepting worship. People bowed down before him. They were bowing and said, oh, you are God. You are son of God. They were bowing before him. He never rebuked any man. So he is not a created thing, but he is the eternal creator. So some people think, um, claim that the Lord Jesus Christ was created, but the Bible is saying something else. So eternal existence is a characteristic that only God possesses, and surely he cannot lose it. So on this part, we can conclude that the Lord Jesus Christ is eternally existing. He was there before, he is there now, he will remain even after. Now we want to see omnipotent. Omnipotent, we want to see another characteristic of God. He has got unlimited power over all created things. He is a unique characteristic of, of the true God. Men, and created things may have some power over some other created things, but our power is limited. Only God's power is unlimited. Nothing is impossible for God. He has got the power to do anything with his creatures and he chooses what he chooses to do. Matthew 19, verse 26. That I Helen. Matthew 19, verse 26. Matthew. Matthew chapter 19, verse 26. Okay. I read in Jesus' name. Amen. But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men, this is impo impossible, but with God, all things are possible. Amen. Then I think it's Luke chapter 18, verse 27. Just a turn, look. And also Mark chapter 10, verse 27, I think. I think there were 27, 27, somewhere there about. Let me quickly check. The terms I've got too many. Yeah. Mark chapter 10, verse 27, and Luke chapter 18, verse 27. If I'm not sure, I can just verify. It's also, it talks about the same thing. This is the same scripture. 
So when I'm studying the Bible, you study the four Gnostics together, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You compare them. Some other things are written more clearly, like Luke chapter 9, verse 23. Pick up your cross daily. It's mentioned daily there. In the other versions, it is not mentioned daily. So you can read Mark chapter 10, verse 27. It says about the same thing. And Jesus, looking upon them, said, with men it is impossible, but not with God. For with God, all things are possible. Can you just take, I'm no longer sure, Luke chapter 18, verse 27, where it talks about the same thing. Luke chapter 18, I think it should be 27, if I'm not sure. Luke 18? 27. Okay, I read in Jesus' name. Amen. And he said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Amen. So you see Mark uh, chapter 10, verse 27, Luke chapter 18, verse 27, and Matthew, uh, Matthew chapter 19, verse 26, is the same thing they are talking about. I'm just giving you a time so that it's good that you know different Bible verses. Let us look at Job chapter 42, verse 2. The Lord can do everything, and no purpose of his can be withheld from him. Nothing can be withheld from him. Let us read. I want us to read because at times as we read, we'll remember. Here I've got a lot of Bible verses, so I want you to write them. I'll be telling you what it means, uh, summarizing them, so that we know what it means. Then we see whether it applies to the Lord Jesus Christ. We are in the Old Testament, we come to the New, we come to the Old, we come to this, so that we see. Yes. Job 42, verse 2. I read in Jesus' name. Amen. I know that thou, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withheld from thee. Amen. Amen. Jeremiah mentioned the same thing. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17. God made heaven and earth. Nothing is too hard for God. Let us read it. Is there anything? He is the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17. 17. Mm -hmm. I read in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Or oh, 27, sir. No, uh, no, 42, verse 17, 1, 7. Okay, not 32. Okay. 30, no, 32, verse 17. Okay, so we said I read in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm. I read in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus. Name. Our Lord, our Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretch out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Amen. Amen. So nothing is too hard for God. We can read later, you can write them down. Mark chapter 14, verse 36, and Genesis chapter 18, verse 14. Let us, um, I, I'm just summarizing them because there are many. I wanted to get about three characteristics of God so that we see what it is. Psalms chapter 50, verse 10 to 12, everything in the earth belongs to God. Everything in this earth belongs to God. Remember Psalms 24, the earth is the lost and the fullness thereof. Because he made it, it belongs to him because he made it. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 14, heaven and earth and everything in it belongs to God. Matthew chapter 11, verse 25, God is Lord of heaven and earth. God is most high above all the earth. 
So the Bible makes it very clear, very, very clear. I want us to see the power or the authority over all that he created. He made it and it belongs to him, his go to life. So there's a power, there's a connection between creation and this unlimited power. He has got unlimited power. I'm going to send you some Bible verses again, which you'll need to compare. If you're using a phone or a computer, please just copy them. On your, in your private time, you can always check them. Okay, so the Lord Jesus Christ possessed, possesses unlimited power because he made and owns all things. He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me in Matthew 28 when he gave the Great Commission. The Lord Jesus Christ is also able to subdue all things to himself. The one that Achimi read, the first Colossians, Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. All things were created through Jesus Christ. And for him, this is exactly the point we are talking about deity. Jesus Christ made everything. So all exists for his purposes and pleasure. Revelation chapter 17, verse 14, we read it yesterday, and Revelation chapter 19, verse 16. Jesus Christ is king of kings, lord of lords. He has authority above that of all the created things. Lord of lords, king of kings. When you read John chapter, John chapter 3, verse 31, or Romans, or together with Romans chapter 9, verse 5, Jesus Christ is above all and over all. So Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is a name which is above every name. This includes his authority. Hence, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess. The Lord Jesus Christ possesses all things that the Father possesses. He rules all over by, he rules over all by right of his authority. He is on his right of ownership. He owns all by being a creator, he owns us. That's why the Bible says he is a mighty creator, mighty God. The first and last, the ones that we talked about yesterday. But that the unlimited power does not mean that God does everything he has power to do. He chooses his terms to do something. He can go and call somebody who's been in jail maybe for seven years and say, I want you to come out now. He can do it if he chooses to, so that people can believe. But the Lord Jesus Christ possessed all power because he was still God when he was on earth. That's why I say, even though he was in the form of God, he chose it not robbery. He thought it not robbery to equate himself with God because he was God. Even though he was God in flesh, he did not want to equate himself with the Father. So he limited this, um, he had limited use or excess of his authority so that he would not conflict with this purpose of a servant because remember he came as a servant so that he will show us how to save. So he had to conform completely to the will of the Father, as humans being should do. Sorry, I have a question, my brother. Yes. This Bible verses you sent it to us. Is, uh, I don't understand. Is the the uh, right number two? You said Isaiah thirty-three, verse twenty-two, and then you write ten, verse. Is it the, the same Isaiah? The ones which I gave you, the Isaiah thirty-three, verse twenty-two. And then, yeah, then you write here again 10, 21. 21. Yeah, Isaiah chapter 10, verse 21. And it's 43, verse, verse 18. Verse 18. Oh, thank you, thank you. If you don't understand the text, we can go to each. That is cool. It's no, not, no, no, it's, it's ah. fine because the, the way you just, you write. <laughs> ah, okay, maybe that's how it came up in the chat. I did not see it. Okay. Thank you. But anytime, please. Come back because it's important for you to understand. When you know who he is, you can come knowing that he's God. At times you just say, ah, Jesus, ah, Jesus. You are calling, you are not calling, you are not calling a prophet. You are not calling a son of God. You are calling God himself. So we need to be careful when you use that name that we don't call it today. So it's very important. So 
the Lord Jesus, there are some Bible verses like First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 24 to 28. So I want to make it very clear. I'm not claiming that we all we know about the inner workings of the gate, but we cannot deny or belittle that the Lord Jesus Christ is called. Because ownership, rulership, and offer this unlimited power that offer the created things. So the Lord Jesus Christ has the same sense that the Father does have. Now we talked about omni. We talked about omnipotent. Now we want to talk about omniscient. Knowing everything, omniscient. Unlimited knowledge is a unique characteristic of God. This characteristic is strongly tied to God's unlimited power. Because God has good power to do everything he chooses to do, it follows that he's good power to know everything. So God is unlimited in wisdom and in knowledge, in the same sense that he's unlimited in power. Is it true? Psalms 139, verse 1 to 6. Let us read. Psalms 139, Verse one to six. From one three nine, one, one to six. Says, oh Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and my uprising. Thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O oh Lord, thou knowest it all together. Hmm. Thou hast beset me behind and before, and lay thy hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attend unto it. Praise the Lord. God knows everything about us. Such knowledge is beyond our ability and to attain unto. Hebrews chapter 4. I want somebody to go to Psalm 33, Psalm 33 verse 18 to 15. Whilst I'm reading um, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 18. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. Seeing that we have a great high priest that is passed into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. We can see the Bible is confirm, confirm, um, confirming what we know. But at times people say, no, no, they, they want to come and confuse with terminology, confuse with theology. Don't need theology. This is simple Bible verses. No creature is hidden him. All things are open before his sight. Psalms 33, verse 15 to 16. Psalm 33. Yeah. For 15 to 15, the reading the Bible for Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He passionate their, he their hearts alive. He considerates all, the, all their works. There is no king saved by the multitude of an host. A mighty man is not delivered by much strength. Amen. Amen. I will read this one. First John chapter 3, verse 19 and 20, but I want the 20. First John chapter 3, verse 19. And hereby we know that we are of truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Verse 20, the one that we know. For if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth the things. That means if you see you are doing something, if you know you cannot go into a church smoking, if you know you cannot go into a church doing certain things, it means your conscience is condemning you already. So when you do those things, that means God knows everything. God is greater than our hearts. He knows all things. 
God counts and names us. Is it true? Psalms 147, verse 4 and 5. These stars that we see, like millions of them, they have got names. You know, speak in every one of them. Let's see. Psalms 147, verse 5, and 4 and 5. And 147, 4 and 5, I read. Great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. The Lord lifted up the meek. He casted the wicked down to the ground. Amen. He raises the humble and he despises the proud. He is mighty in his power. His understanding is infinite. So we can see there's a connection between power and knowledge. First Kings chapter 8, verse 39, it says, only God knows the hearts of all men. You will use the power in order to judge men. Remember Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10 and 10. Who understands the heart? The heart is desperately wicked. That's what the Bible says, desperately wicked. I, the Lord, will search, I, the Lord, searches the heart and try the reins, and I will give every man according to that which is done. When we stand before the Lord, our bitterness, our this malice, everything comes out like this because he knows you. You don't even know your heart. So when you come in and say, you know Jesus Christ, when you don't understand your heart, for me, it's the greatest blasphemy. We need to be very careful. Let us not believe in the God that we pray to. We have become too familiar. Because of um, there is no regulation on the internet that anybody who just open up ministry, they come, they say they are preaching. Many have been recruited by the devil. They talk about things they don't understand. Let us encourage people, not condemning. God is not condemning people. God is saying, come, come back. Let people know. Whether they are doing something, don't condemn them. You show them love. But at times we come, all holiness ministries, you are going to hell. So holiness ministries are full of people who are afraid of hell, who are not necessarily, necessarily Christians. They are not born again. They are not born again at all. They are just, yes, God, I was in CHMA, he said it's a ministry. Yes, it's his ministry, but are you his? So we need to be careful, extremely careful. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. We can read it, we can read it later. First Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9. Man cannot know what is in the heart of man unless the man somehow reveals it. I wouldn't know what the Dachim is thinking until you tell me. That's how I will know it. Or 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. You wouldn't know until you tell me what you are thinking. I hear people say, do you know what I think? No, I don't. So the ability to know everything he chooses to know, and in particular, to know what is in the heart of men. Remember the Lord Jesus Christ, we are going to read. Let's read Colossians chapter 2, verse 2 to 3. I want us to show, to show us what the Lord Jesus Christ claimed about men. Colossians chapter 2, verse 2 to 3. Colossians 2, 2 to 3, I read. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love and unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Amen. In Amen. him are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge hidden. Is it true? John chapter 2, verse 24 and 25. But Jesus did not commit himself unto them because he knew all men. 
and needed not any that he needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. You see what the Bible was talking about, the other type of verses that we read in the Old Testament. Now it's confirming it about the Lord Jesus Christ. He said they knew everything in men. How would he know? How old was he that he would know things that happened 40 years ago? Even the people that were living that time did not know. So we can see there's another part, John chapter 16, verse 30, I think. John chapter 16, verse 30. It's quite a very interesting topic because it helps us to see certain things. He says, John chapter 16, verse 30. Now are we sure that thou knowest all things, and it is not that any man should ask thee. By this we believe that thou comest forth from God. This were the Jews talking. He said, if you know all these things, you know everything. How come you know everything? So we can see that he possesses deity. Only God knows all things. John chapter 21, verse 17. He said, he said unto the third time, Simon, 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 Jonas, laughest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, laughest thou me? And he said, um, he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Apostle Peter was saying, but you know everything. The other Bible verses say he was annoyed. But you know everything now. Why are you asking me? He said, feed my sheep. If you love me, feed my sheep. If you love me, follow my commandments. That is, quoting the Bible, praying in Hebrew, does not make you any better Christian. I've seen people coming to impress with their Hebrew or few Bible verses. It's not the Bible verses that you come to claim you know. It is leaving those things that you are learning in the Bible. That's what the Bible is all about. Don't be deceived by people holding the Bible. I'll give us some other Bible verses again that we can write. Then we'll continue maybe in the next session. If we've got questions, then we'll take. It's very important to understand God we are praying to. So this was being expressed by Apostle Peter that you know all things. He was even annoyed. So this is a unique power of deity. Yet the Lord Jesus Christ had it and he exercised it on earth. You know all things, Lord. You remember the woman that he met at the world, that prostitute. She was just told that is not your husband. She ran into the city and said, I have met him. Say who? He said, you know everything about me. She quickly amplified everything. I don't know, the Bible doesn't say much, but it says that short conversation that he had with her, she knew this man knows more than anything. He said, no, he's not even the prophet. Revelation chapter 2, verse 23. The Lord Jesus Christ searches the hearts and minds in order to reward men for their works. This unlimited knowledge rest only in the divine, only the divine power. Only God knows because he chooses to know. So we need to understand this one. In this way, while he was on earth accomplishing his purpose as a servant, the Lord Jesus Christ did not always exercise this unlimited power to know all things. Is it true that you did not like use all the power? Dr. Helen, can you read for me Mark chapter 18, verse 34? That he chooses to apply the power or not. That's it. Oh, okay. Let's see whether it's true. Mark 18, verse 32. Mark 13. 32. Read in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, but of that day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angel which are in heaven, neither the son but the father. 
So here, the Bible is saying he did not use this power. There are times where you choose to exercise that power or not. So he said, I do not know because God maybe said this, this part when you are there, we will not know. But knowing God as we do, we don't say the Bible is contradicting itself. He said the actual time where God will say, now rapture my children, bring them home, we don't know. He is still defending us, the Lord Jesus Christ. Rapture could have happened a long time ago because we are not ready. The Christians are not ready. They are busy fighting, busy um, entertaining in the church. That's what we do. Telling people things they want to hear, not giving them the word of God. So now we'll round up with this one. Or should we, should we do? Uh, no, let us. The omnipresent will do it next week so that we take time for questions. Do we have any questions, contributions? Is there any question like we had yesterday? Where, oh, okay. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's um, related to what we are learning or maybe indirectly or directly. About the, um, the one of the disciples or two of the disciples more than came to our Lord Jesus Christ. Sorry, I was like a bit touched when she went and was asking like favor from the in the side of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he was telling her that the heaven, kingdom of heaven, is, is meant for them that they have been prepared. So I was like. These ones are followers of our Lord Jesus Christ, and this was the answer that like he was given to them. So I don't know how can you? He's like I was so he he he, he I know he knew all things. Even the case of Judas Iscariot, he knew that the one is going to betray him. He was the one, and but here, like these ones, we are followers, disciples of our Lord Jesus Christ, and he was telling them that this heaven is meant for them that be prepared for. So I was thinking. Does it mean that, that oh, you know, God bless you, sir. Praise the Lord. Let, like, let, yeah. let, us, let us go to where Auntie is talking about. <laughs> it's in Mark chapter 10. Yeah. I want us to look where it is so that you can follow. I, I'm not reading for you, Auntie, because you know it. But I want others to follow so that they can get an understanding as well. Because it's important. Let us start from... Yeah, let us start from 34, I think. Mark chapter 10, verse 34, I think. He said, and they shall mock him. No, let us start from 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came come unto him, saying, Master, we would uh, that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. And he said unto them, what will you do that I should do for you? They said unto him, grant unto us that we may sit one on the right, right hand, the other on the left hand side, on the, on the glory. But Jesus said unto them, you know that you what you ask for. This is where you're coming from now. This, is, this was where um, these two guys, the sons of Zebedee, these were called the son of Boanikas, the sons of Thunder. This is the John that wrote the book of John, the, the other book of the, the three books of John and the book of Revelation. The one was lying on the Lord Jesus Christ chest. Every time people misbehave, say, send them thunder, send thunder so that they are destroyed by people. But he said, God is love. When he matured as a Christian, he understood. So now to your question why these guys were saying, can you come and sit? Can, can you repeat your question, please? I just wanted to go where it was. Yeah, it was a bit like short, like a bit attention, like when the mother asked of that and the response of our Lord Jesus Christ. Vividly, this was we are the followers of our Lord Jesus Christ, and this was the answer he was given. That means there was no, there no unless they, they made it, you know, there was no assurance of that heaven for them. 
though there are still um, disciples following him and he was just giving this kind of response to, to the mother to them, you know? So I was like, it was an astonishing response, like followers of our Lord Jesus. And it was, it was not giving them that assurance as, yeah, them that been prepared. So that means if they couldn't, if they didn't make it, that means they're not going to make it enter heaven, though they were disciples following him. So I was like, Ah. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the Bible makes it very clear. When the Lord Jesus Christ was asked, they say, few people, he, he reiterated this, very few people will enter. Hmm. Remember when he was talking, is it the um, Luke chapter 13, he said, make, or Luke John, um, is it John chapter 14, said, strive, Matthew chapter 7 or 7, where he says, strive to enter through the narrow, the narrow, the narrow door. Why this door is narrow, few and fewer people find it. Father Abraham in Genesis chapter 17, verse 1, I think, he said, Walk before me and be thou perfect. Remember, this is the man, the only man that God said he was my faith. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Be ye holy, for I am holy. The one that he quoted in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16 and 17 which was, I think he was quoting Exodus chapter 19, verse six. Be ye holy for I am holy. The condition of God, he is not a respecter of men. When you read Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 24, let us read it and see, no man is promised. No man is promised. Yet. When we hear people being presumptuous and say this one, like it's a very good observation you are making for us. These are people working with God. He said on the other side, yeah, we can talk. But when it comes to that side, no, nothing unholy shall enter into his presence. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 24. I think it's 24. Okay, 24, I read in the mighty name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. But when the righteous turned away from his righteousness and committed iniquity, and do it according to all the abominations that the wicked man doeth. Shall he live? All his righteousness that he had done shall not be mentioned. In his trespass that he had trespassed, and in his sin that he has sinned, in them shall he die. Amen. Amen. So the Bible is making it very clear. He is saying, if a righteous person, are we, are we seeing the pattern now? You were once righteous. You go and commit a sin. If you die in that sin without repentance, you are going to perish. Not to waste. So nobody has been promised this heaven. Hold fast that which you have. Remember that he, he has mentioned it several times. Hold fast that which you have. That no man take it away from you. So don't be lied to one saved forever. Saved. It's a gospel that comes from another planet. We don't know where it's coming from. Inspired surely of the devil. So when the people come and tell you, say, my, my sister, God is not wicked, their opinion, because they are comfortable, you being in sin, or they are being used of the evil one to comfort you so that you continue on that broad path. No man, Apostle Paul, after preaching, he said, after having preached this gospel, let me not be a castaway. Is it not the man that God said, I had to give him a servant of the devil, a messenger of Satan, where he said, I beseech the Lord three times. And he said, my grace is sufficient for you and my power is made perfect in your weakness. He was shown a lot of things. This is a man who wrote almost the New, <laughs> the New Testament single-handedly. But he was saying, after having preached this gospel, let me not be a customer. What made him write that? Do you think he was writing for us or for himself? That what he saw, no man, there are people that have been taken to heaven, that have been taken to hell, that are still going to perish in hell. It doesn't mean if God shows you hell today, they are not going back there. It's how you live your life, you choose. He would have chosen you for his own glory, for his own purposes. That go and tell people that this place exists. Go and tell them the qualification for avoiding this place and the qualification for entering into my kingdom so that people know. People, this hell, when people don't have money, they say, today is hell, I don't have money. It has been so desensitized. 
that people take it like a laughing matter. It's not a laughing matter. There is nothing of it. If you born a child today now, after 30 minutes you go to hell, you forgot that you, you, you get a child. You forget that I, I, I had a child some few minutes ago. You will totally forget. That you had billions of dollars, it's only here on this earth. Once you cross over on the other side, you will get exactly according to that which you have done on earth. So do not be misled by messengers that are being influenced by the doctrines of the devil. Like I said, once I climb the pulpit, I preach his word. That's what he wants. That's what I give the people. Whether I follow it, but I know what he wants. God made it very clear to me. He said, follow my righteousness, follow my holiness. He said it in several times, continue on the path of righteousness, continue on the path of holiness. Don't look at people, don't look at what they will say. Just look at me, I know what I'm doing. So at times we listen to people and the influencers. People can say you are a great man of God. Who said I'm great? I never take such, such compliments. I refused them 12 years ago when I started climbing the pulpit. I said, no, 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 thank you. I don't need those compliments. I'm not, I don't compare myself to another minister because I did not call anybody. That's one mistake Christians make. Comparing yourself to another. We have been given different places. You have been given the gift, the grace to know the scriptures, the, the gift to pray maybe for five, six hours the gift to prophesy, the gift to organize administration and management. So people have been given different graces in ministry to work together as a team. Not that I'm better, not that you are less. We complement one another. That's how we're supposed to. May the Lord help us. Another contribution is, 